actually I'm very appreciate that the organizer arranged my talk right after Mala and, uh, and Guillermo's talk because they very much set up the perfect stage for my talk. So, and I'm going to precisely talk about two things. Um, one is about somehow related to invariance, um, how the, the uh, Stefan Mala has said very importantly, how to make uh, extract invariant representation from images, right? how make you visual information that is invariant to all the scoop transformations, affine, projective, and then Stefan talk, talked about translation in particular. And also, you know, the, the return of the Jedi, so the, the how do we work with low rank structures? You know, uh, Professor Guillermo Shapiro has talked about the return of PCA. Um, so I will hope I will add a little bit to that uh, perspective, how to make PCA works even better. Right, so the, how important it is. I think Guillermo has made a very strong case. It's important, but how we make it more better. So this is joint work with my former student, John Wright, and also Amanda Candace of uh, Stanford. So the context is very easy. So that uh, really these days we're dealing with increasing, increasing massive high dimensional data. Images, videos, web data, you name it, right? So what we're trying to do, so everybody's trying to do is try to extract some kind of compact knowledge very compact knowledge from such massive data sets, right? Because we, our decision, our action relies on very simple decisions. We, we cannot consume so much information. We try to come extract some very, very compact, what's, what's this video is all about, or what this image is all about, quickly summarize the content, right? So classification is one of the task. Well, this, if you have good solutions to you know, be able to extract con uh, knowledge from the data, you can, you know, it's, this affects almost everything we do these days, right? Image, image processing, recognition, videos, um, web search. Essentially, the way we can do it is because you know we have to do it in order to get application. So, but when you have very massive high dimensional data, what's your hope? So, your only hope is that data has some structure in it, right? Has some very low dimensional structure in it. Right? If it's just a random blob of data in there, no matter what you do, you lose. Right? There's nothing intelligent or clever you can do about much about it if the data is totally random, right, has no structure. For example, let me give you an example. In fact, if the data has uh, striking structures, whether you notice it or not, right? So now the, some of the new mathematical tools pro help us to discover that. For example, like image, face images. I'll just use this example, right? This actually applies to the same principle that applies to all kinds of other data. We'll go through that later in the, in the talk. Just starting from, think about the image of the faces, like your own faces, under different lighting conditions. Right, you can take megapixel camera, right? That means that you take a million pixels of your image, right, face. Right, you can take under gazillions of lighting conditions. It doesn't really matter. So that's basically a million dimension vector sitting on gazillions, gazillions of points, sitting on millions of dimensions. Right? Regardless, this can be very high dimensional data. It turns out there's some very, very, they lie on very low dimensional internal structure. Stefan talked about there is also low dimensional manifolds and also lies on very maybe, maybe low, low lie on very low dimensional subspaces. So your job is trying to identify them and hopefully make use of it. Right? This is kind of observation we see in computer vision a long time ago. Right? For example, face image like this actually lies on very low dimensional subspaces, regardless what the dimension, how many pixels you measure, regard how many pictures you take. So the central question is how can we learn? extract such low dimensional structure and then exploit for it, right? So this is the key to almost everything we do today. Well, the life is not easy. So uh, the data that they presented it to us is actually quite different from the old traditional engineering regime that where we control the data acquisition process, right, like in the radar or in the circuits. We design in such a way that the data we acquired is good. But nowadays in the internet, you're presented with data like this, right? So you lose the control of data acquisition. So you have to deal with the variability come with that. So there's many of them. There's missing observation, for example, the rating of the movies. Also, there could be corruptions, right? Also, there's also transformations. It could be smile, there could be pose, and so on, right? So many of the classical method, there's still structure in such data, right? But uh, if you directly apply them, you get garbage, right? Like this girl PC will actually break down. We'll see why. So this is sort of the talk. I'm trying to get a little bit of overview of what has been going on in the past two to three years in my group and also other related work in this direction. I try to make 
PCA works in this kind of scenario, as well as how to handle the kind of transformation, additional variabilities that presented in visual data, such as alignment, such as transformations. Right? So I'll use the, the image alignment and also this kind of transform invariant textures. So, and to try to highlight how to make this kind of model, mathematical model, useful for some of the visual gratifications. So just a one minute, one second uh, recoup of the, what, uh, the re re recapture of this, what the PCA does, right? So you have data, it lies on very high dimensional space, M and N could be very large, but if it lies on the very low dimensional subspace, the rank of the matrix is very low, right, essentially. So in PCA, we know how to, if you, our observation normally is a noisy version of the data, right? So you can have uh, some ID Gaussians to it, and the job is trying to recover A the best you can. We know how to do it for about 100 years now, right? So it's, it's very simple. The optimal solution to this is just to compute the singular variety composition and the threshold of the smaller, sort of smaller ones, right? This is really has become one of the most fundamental statistical tools, the you know, multivariate analysis, right? Has been most used tremendously. But since day one, people know PCA is very brittle to outliers, to corruptions, right? It follows the Gaussian distribution, everything's fine. But if you have a single, even a single entry gets arbitrarily corrupted, the estimated low dimensional subspace can be arbitrarily far from the ground truth. So that's actually a problem people know from the day one. So, so in reality, I just use this to just exaggerate what the problem we might be facing is that the, the, this is actually the observation given to you. You know it's coming from the same, same girl, right? So if you recover it properly, all the images will be highly correlated. Despite, however, you have to get rid of some of the corruptions. Right. So the mathematics to talk about the problem is very, very easy to state. So I have some data matrix. I want to split into something highly correlated, low rank. So if, you know, in idealist case, this should be identical. This is rank one. All the images are linearly correlated. And despite some sparse errors, some pixels are arbitrarily corrupted. I don't know which one. I don't know the magnitude. I don't even, may not even have a, method, a statistical model for it. So can we actually solve this problem? Well, at first sight, it's impossible because you have twice as many unknowns as equations given to you, measurements to you, right? So this is the inverse problem. Well, the solution we're looking for, the hope is that the solution we're looking for has very good structure. It's low rank or sparse. So this problem is not new. We're not the first one to pose this is important problem to solve. In fact, almost in every scientific field, you might find a version of robust PCA, try to make PCA robust to this kind of outliers, to this kind of corruptions. Right here, I just listed out the few related in computer vision. Right? There's some, some, as you can see, the, the, the work actually traced back to 70s or in probably even earlier. So despite there's a lot of clever algorithms on this area and try to, some of them actually works very well for specific applications. But the situation is that there's no polynomial time algorithm with strong performance guarantee up till today. Right, also, you know, about a couple of years ago. Right. So can we say something about this? Right, so, as, you know, in the spirit of uh, uh, Stefan's talk, that can we understand why this algorithm may work or, or not, right? Under what condition we might expect this kind of problem have good solutions, right? So in this case, for example, um, notice that you cannot arbitrarily split any two matrix because there's some sparse matrix is also low rank. For example, you have a matrix only have one entry that is on zero. That is rank one, also is a sparse one matrix. So you cannot hope that can be done. But one thing you can ask is to make the problem well better posed is that you can say, can we at least separate A that is incoherent with the standard matrix, with the sparse entries, right? So A itself is not that sparse. Can we do that? So this is some mathematical uh, conditions um, to make sure this is kind of a conventional way of specifying they're somehow incoherent. So under this condition, the problem might be possible. You know, there might be a well-defined solution now, but the problem remains very hard. Right. How do you do this? Because you have to find that the matrix A with the lowest possible rank and the sparsest possible E agree with your data. Right. Unfortunately, this is an NP-hard problem. Right. It's actually one of the, some of the hardest NP-hard problem. It's intractable for higher dimensional data. You know, the kind of data we're dealing with the images, it's, it's just forget about it. Right. So, the, of course, but the, the thing that inspired us from compressing is that in order to, you know, encourage sparsity, try to find a sparse solution, you can actually, instead of doing the minimizing the sparse norm, you actually can actually reclassify as convex surrogate, 
right? In the case of a one, zero norm, you replace with one norm. And there's actually a similar uh, notion for rank as well. The convex envelope of the rank function as a matrix, the function of a matrix, is actually the nuclear norm of the matrix. It's just the sum of the singular values. Right? Think about it as one norm on the singular values. So of course, everybody, so then you, instead of solve this very, very difficult NPR problem, you try to solve this convex surrogate instead, right? This is very natural to write this down. Everybody can do this. So this is a, sounds like a very good you know, heuristic. Everybody can do this. But the million dollar question is, when does this work, right? So the solution to this problem is that the same as the solution you started with. Right? So the answer, of course, is not always. Because the original problem is NPR, this problem is polynomial, right? Unless P equal to NP, otherwise you have a different. But the hope is, the hope maybe it succeeds for the cases we care about. Can it be? Well, we're engineers, we can do simulations, right? We try to find out, you know, if the solution uh, by solving the convex optimization agree with the original problem or not. We can just produce all those instances, see that generating, randomly generating no rank matrix and sparse errors, and add them up, and you run the convex optimization, see when they there start to recover, right? As you can see that when the rank of the matrix A is a small fraction of the dimension, and the fraction of entry corrupted is also low, below this curve, the algorithm, the convex optimization, solved the original NPR problem precisely, right, with property one. And also, this is actually, it's Actually, the similar notion has been noticed in matrix completion. In fact, you, have, you can actually, if you know which entry are corrupted, that becomes a completion problem. It's a slightly simpler, and as you can see, you can enjoy a wider range of success. Right. The question is, can you actually prove this works? Right. So it turns out this is one of the results we uh, recently obtained. It turns out that actually mathematics can actually prove under fairly broad conditions. You actually should expect the convex optimization to work. Here, the rank of the matrix is bounded from above by something almost proportional to the dimension of the matrix, dimension of the matrix, and only a log factor is here. You lose a log factor here. And also, the number of entries you can corrupt is some constant fraction. Well, in a minute, we'll see how high the fraction can be. Right? So under these conditions, as long as A and the, 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 the standard basis are incoherent, you can just solve this fixed convex optimization, find the global optimal that actually recover the ground truth. So this is actually gave you the very strong theoretic guarantee. By solving the convex optimization, you actually end up with recovering the low rank matrix despite gross corruptions. And also you can actually combine it with matrix completion. For example, the matrix can be corrupted and I only show you 10% of the entries. Well, the, this is arbitrary, but it's just to illustrate the idea. But still, just solve the convex constraint of convex optimization, you actually recover the ground truth. How far you can go with uh, tolerating the errors? Actually, it's surprisingly far. So if the sign of the error is random, 50-50, positive, negative, so if something very striking happens. So the percentage error can arbitrarily co-opt the entry when the matrix goes large, approach to 100%. So basically, you start with trying to correct a sparse number of entries. Turns out that the algorithm gives you more. You can correct dense errors, arbitrary corruptions. So by solving the convex optimization. This is, only, this is a phenomenon only occurs in very high dimensional spaces. It's almost completely counterintuitive, right? We have a similar result for the sparse recovery as well, turns out. And also you can combine with noise. Here you, have, you cannot expect to find the ground truth anymore. You can only hope to find a stable estimate of the ground truth. Turns out that's also the case. Actually, this bound, uh, we had uh, this result uh, in the last year, I says, ISIT, but this bound SC just recently was tightened. The optimum bound was obtained by, I think, uh, Martin Wainwright of UC Berkeley. Right? His most recent paper provided a very sharp bound on C. So there's also, of course, uh, 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 additional results. If here we assume A is actually deterministic, E is a, a random or with no noise, and there's actually a com very complementary result from the, the uh, MIT group that their A is actually random Gaussian matrix, uh, random, actually, no rank matrix, and E is actually deterministic. They are worrying about the worst possible errors that will prevent you from recovering the rank matrix. Right? They have, a, have a, also a bound of how much error you can tolerate. But compared to this kind of model, actually, the result is much, you know, in terms of 
although they are not that comparable, but because the assumptions are different, but at least um, the, 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 the number of errors you can tolerate uh, given by our results is much, much stronger. They're suggesting the convex optimization works under a much wider range of conditions. So just give you a little bit of sense of what we really have done so far, the landscape of theory of recovering low rank matrix despite the missing entry, which is the matrix completion, despite the unknown corruption, right? So the simulation suggests the algorithm works under this curve. But what people can prove so far is just along this line, right? Even for matrix completion. If you're anyone here in the audience interested in theory, uh, proving that you can get into here is a, going to be a huge deal. Or even prove such a curve exists and what it is. Right? So people have done, like Donahoe and uh, uh, Jerry Tanner has done very good work for sparse recovery. Do we have a similar theory for low rank matrix recovery? We're still far from there. But this is already suggested by simulations. Right? So just quickly to, 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 to summarize the theory. So, and, the theory is sort of very encouraging. It says that uh, you know, there's a very high dimensional combinatorial problem we actually can solve that convex optimization. But it turns out those convex optimization themselves are not picnics at all. Right? For example, the kind of scale we're dealing with in computer vision is usually 1,000 by 1,000 and even higher matrix. So for example, 1,000 by 1,000 matrix, you're solving a 2 million dimensional unknowns. Right? You try to solve a convex optimization with 2 million unknowns. Right? So this is very much all the interior points, Newton-based method are out of the window. You have, you're, forced, you're, you're forced back to the first order method. So that's actually inspired a lot of development in the past couple of years of solving this class of problems. So one particular class of solutions is based on the Lagrangian Lagrange multiplier has shown very good you know, promise in solving this kind of problem very, very fast. And also it's based on very simple iterative thresholdings of the algorithm. So three steps, that's it. Just iterate that you are guaranteed to converge to global minimum and you find the ground truth in a very small number of iterations here that this is the all the algorithm people have tried we have tried uh, different com convex optimization algorithm there might be even more I mean we just listed here for illustrating the path of how things could be speed up by solving the same problem same convex optimization problem just with slightly different ma mathematical algorithm the bottom line is that today we actually can solve very large scale robust PCA problem uh, with only a very small constant factor of extra cost to the standard PCA. So if you have a matrix you don't know if it's corrupted or not, just apply this, pay this extra price, you get a sort of you know, clean answer. We'll see it's actually very important for, uh, now I'll start from just show how this might be useful. You know, I probably have another 20 minutes. So how this might be useful for some of the image vision or image processing problems, right? What this allows us to do, or what a modification we still need to make in order to make them more generalizable. So this is a baby example. You know, Guillermo shows some examples like that. So here, this is just 200 frames of airport security you know, videos. It's about, uh, you know, here it's about 30,000 dimensions. We, we don't do anything. We don't do pre-processing, no features whatsoever, not even smoothing, just raw pixels. Stack them on columns of the matrix and send it into the algorithm. Keep in mind, the algorithm doesn't even have a free parameter for you to tune. Right? You solve a fixed convex optimization and give you the low rank part and the sparse part. So the low rank part actually turns out to be the background. The foreground is actually the moving parts. So in the spirit of uh, Guillermo's talk, this is just try to fit the data with one Gaussian, but fit in a robust fashion, right? That's it. So actually you identify the structure of the, you know, you can even change the lighting by background lightings, because if the scene is largely ambition, those, uh, no matter how many lightings you change, they still just span a very low dimensional subspace. Oh? <laughs> oh, shoot. No? Um, What's going on? I lost some channel. Maybe I just unplugged. Okay. Yeah. I lost. Yeah. So this is just to show you. Um, actually, we started uh, this investigation by trying to make uh, face recognition works better because even under very highly controlled scenario, you take picture of person, there's still corruptions, right? There's the specularities. There, there's going to be shadows. So you don't get a very good model of the data. Right? Even you control the acquisition process very carefully. 
right? The data itself presents challenges. So it turns out actually you can actually get a very, very clean low, di low dimensional model for the face. And there's one immediate application we know in computer vision is try to recover 3D shapes from changing the lighting, right? This called a photometric stereo. So ideally, the, the, the intensity you see at a pixel is just the normal vector of the surface multiplied in the product with the direction of the lights. So you can actually imagine you can take a picture of this under many, many lighting conditions, you get a rank three matrix. But in practice, you don't, because there's always specularities, shadows, motion blurs, and everything. This is the kind of real data you get, right? About 20% of the pixel is going to be shadows. 13% are going to be specularities. So this is by definition about good realistic rendering algorithm. So it turns out the problem is a perfect low rack matrix recovery problem. All you have to do is just solve the fixed convex optimization. You don't have to do anything. So this is the kind of accuracy you can get. The improvement is striking, right? Previously, people for photometric stereo, you'll be lucky you get around the error of uh, average error about one or two degrees. People then start to integrate into get a surface. But if you really do the right thing, do the correct error, you actually very much slap on the ground truth. Right? So this is the kind of striking comparison you can get. Even the maximum error you get is actually lower than the previous average error. And also, of course, in the real images, you do get an improvement, especially in the areas where the occlusions right, cause troubles for recovery. You need requirement. Well, real data is never as good, right? Never nobody going to give you aligned fake images. So for example, what if there is a scale transformation? And if you apply the robust PC to that kind of data, you can still get that garbage, right? So you have to align the data before you can even see the structure. So what do you do? Now the problem becomes very highly nonlinear now. Right? Because the, 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 the transformation could be affine, you know, projective, translation whatsoever. But we don't know how to do this. Well, what we know is how to solve a linearized problem. So we can actually just do what we usually do as engineers. We linearize against the, the transformation so in a similar spirit as uh, Stefan did. Right? S small deviation from, from the original data. Well, let's try to solve that. And we solve that in an iterative fashion. But this problem, if you linearize against tau, this is exactly a robust PCA problem. This is still convex. You, know, you don't even have to change the code that much. So you solve this problem, but you solve this iteratively. Uh, for example, this is my students. Just, you know, the lighting is changing. He's waving his head around the camera. So just to show you the process of the iteration. Right? So every time you solve this robust PCA by estimating the, the delta tau in such a way that minimizes the rank and the sparsity, you can actually push the data to the per pixel alignment. Here, you don't have to do know much about the tau to begin with. It has a fairly large range of convergence. Actually, this is also a fair uh, last year's CEPR work comparing to a pre previous state of art. You actually see similar you know, increase in the accuracy in alignment. Despite change of lightings, despite you don't know the, 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 the registration to begin with. And this is my students have some fun in front of the camera. So there's some hats, glasses, and also, so you can align them and also Immediately, the byproduct, you get the low rank part, it gets every pixel repaired. Right. So since I work for Microsoft, I have to do something to pay the bill. So, so this is, uh, yeah, the pun intended. So this is uh, so this, this kind of data from internet, right? So it's actually a dream for statistician. I mean, there's something in common here, right? What's in common? Right? It's the same person under different lighting. And, so even if you do careful face recognition, uh, face re detection, like aligned eyes, there's still tremendous variability in here, right? Expressions, occlusions, and so on. So you do average, it looks very, very fuzzy, right? The more you use, the more fuzzy it gets. So it doesn't help with recognition, right? So this is kind of dilemma people feel. So now you can actually do alignment. You can apply affine or projective transformation to align the images. But if this is not good enough, still, after alignment, there's still a lot of uh, diversity, right? Still a lot of, you can actually just take the low rank part. Because all the inconsistency went into the sparse part, right? So you get a very, very sharp statistics of what the person looks like. So we call this, you know, celebrity impression. Because, you know, if you don't do the alignment or repairing, you get this kind of fuzzy average. But if you do that, you get a very robust statistical estimation what the average mean is. So it's a very iconic expression from all the celebrities. You can get close your eyes, think about what the Arnold Schwarzenegger looks like, right, in your head. That's very much it. Right? So in, in, in a sense, you can potentially use this kind of data for face recognition and so on. So the whole process can be automatic. Right? 
It also works for handwritten digits. You can actually align them. There's actually previous work shows how to align them very well. But what they don't know is they cannot repair, right? What the three should be, right? So now the, what the result of byproduct from here is that through, you know, majority vote, you actually can repair what the letter actually should be written like. And also, of course, for structure for motion, we, we do the matching all the time, but there's always something in front. You can get rid of them, so you clean it. And every pixel gets repaired in a very, very sharp and precise way. So in terms of invariance, right? So this is about multiple images. How do you use the kind of structure to extract the correlation among multiple images, like videos or multiple image set? But in fact, in a single image, there's tremendous structure as well. So we actually discovered this later, after we, we did the, the image alignment work. Right? So everybody probably knows the Warlands story, right? The last year, the most exciting story about you, you pointing some camera to uh, Spanish, they gave you the English the translation, right? But what they didn't tell you that you have to do this, in fact, it's, it's just a video. It's not really a real product yet. And also, if, what they don't tell you is that what if the, you point your camera in a slanted way, right? The world we see through camera is tilted. Right? The transformation caused the variability. Right? It's the same object, but if you look at a front of angle, different pose, it looks completely different. Right? How can we get something invariant? So human eyes has absolutely no problem in the split of second, we know exactly what this picture is. Right? It's orientation, it's generated from such a pattern, and something gets occluded in front. Right? How can we do this in such a very quick way? Right? So this is actually what we are trying to solve. From such an initial position, can we actually find the transformation such that in a new window, you can interpret the data in such a way? Right? So in fact, that video is a result of our algorithm. So what's wrong with the original orientation? I mean, the transformal orientation. If you look at the image itself as a matrix, the rank is very high because it's rotated and everything. Right? After you apply, put this pattern in the frontal view, this become highly periodic, and the pattern become very regular. Hence, the matrix should be very low rank. The intensity itself should be low rank matrix. Right? So you actually use this as a cue to recover the deformation what we call it, transform invariant low rank texture. So this is not kind of random texture that the, uh, the Stefan worked at. It's actually something very regular. We like regular patterns because everything in this room is regular almost. Right? So again, you have to solve, you can solve the problem exactly the same way. Right? You don't even have to change the code that much. Actually, it's simpler because you only have to deal with one transformation at a time. This transformation can be almost uh, many things can be affine, projective, we'll see how far we can go, right, with different transformations. So, well, what's the first thing you learn in computer vision? Edge detection, corner detection, right? What is the edge? It's a rank one texture. What is a corner? It's rank two texture. Here, if you want this kind of algorithm, not only you know it's a corner, you know it's orientation to you, right? Every corner in this room tells you it's orientation to itself, right? Give you tremendous information. Anything symmetry, anything regular, regular. You can rectify them, right? You don't have to recognize uh, license plate from that angle. You can always rectify it, then recognize it, right? So this is a arguably shape from texture, right? You start from the, the red window is always the initial of our algorithm. The uh, green window is output, right? This is rectified. So you resample the green window. You get the perfectly rectified. Here, the nice thing about this algorithm is totally holistic. It's raw pixels. There's no filtering, no features, nothing. Just the raw pixel patches. What you see is what you get. What you get is what you see. It's very, very holistic. Right? So that's actually feel very good about it. So that also that the, you know, the, your Chinese uh, characters, most of them actually are low rank textures. We'll show how far we can go with Chinese characters. First we thought just some, some, some small fraction of Chinese characters are low rank textures. Turns out almost all of them. Also English, you're staring at the low rank textures all the time. We're not aware of it. So, so because of this, you can rectify the arbitrary angle. You look at them, you can rectify them. Your brain can undo that process. It has, there's information, and it's mathematical. There's information for you to do that. So also that uh, this is a barcode, text, anything sort of has any symmetry, any regularity in the natural world, right? So you can rectify for you. This is Obama, right? This is actually, if you don't like a uh, tilted tower, you can actually always rectify it. And that's, that's still much better with this kind of images, right? 
Um, so there has been, you know, it's, it's people think that the recovery of the 3D from a single image is a very, very challenging problem, right? In the past few years, there's been this effort of using machine learning. You train machine learning algorithm with millions of patches, lay pre-label data, right? Try to recover what is the orientation, pointing left or right from, in fact, well, image tells you much more than that, right? So it's, you can actually do way better than that. So in fact, it's very, very precise. This is just the result of the algorithm. So you actually can bring it all the order to the front. This is just the sequence that shows how the algorithm converge. Right? And you actually recover low rank. And also you know something is blocking there. Also some lights are not consistent. Right? So you get this kind of, and also for this kind of street scenes, if you do, yeah, there are actually other algorithms can do this. You know, you probably can try to use them, let's say vanishing points. Uh, edge detection, starting from edge detection and vanishing points, you can do this. But it's very hard for you to engineer any system as robust as this, and also that can work under different lighting conditions, different contrast, works for all types of images. Probably not very many people see you know, Empire State Building from this angle, right? So you actually can just do this in a very, very simple way. So this is downtown Los Angeles, right? So this is Stefano, I visit Stefano. You can take a picture like this, if you don't know where to run, just run this on a patch, uh, on, a, on a grid. So every patch, it will, uh, it will show you the local orientation precisely, right? And then you can, you know, add some posters, you know, you know, fit, everything will be totally automatic. So many other applications, so, you know, in, a, in a com computer vision, we do 3D reconstruction, but what this, we start with, we start with points. We, we try to correspond, starting from calibration, we start from corners, right? We try to match corners, match edges. But can we do that without edges, without features? Just do holistically, right? Well, it's just an exercise we did. You know, well, what is addition to the camera calibration? Just tau becomes a little bit more complicated. You add the intrinsic parameter, you add the reading distortion, right? We just estimate in the same way. You don't even have to rewrite the code. It's the same code, right? You just automatically make every line straight, straight, you know, and also all the this is a fisheye, fisheye pinko camera. So all you have to do is just say this, this, this area should be straight, should be rectified like this. That's all you have to do. You have your cell phone pointing at any regular structure and you can calibrate it right by this way. And you don't have, to, you don't have to click on points or edges. You don't have to even do anything. Right? So this is actually, a, very soon you'll see the, probably the webcam from Microsoft will never have really distortion anymore. Right? Very wide webcam. Here also, it's totally automatic. You can actually just calibrate it on the fly. And what about the structure, right? There's also all kinds of curved surface. The tower also can model what's, what's deforming the 3D, right? You can actually just uh, simultaneously estimate the, sh the shape. All you have to do is estimating when the shape, when you unwrap, you get a very regular pattern. That's it, right? So you actually get the 3D shape and also the camera position from a single picture. You get all the shapes and the regular pipe. So this is actually to show the convergence in the, so in the image domain, so you just push into there, you actually can get a 3D model of the surface, right? So this is a sequence of ten, uh, the, the temple of heaven in Beijing. We actually run, you can run all the other structure from motion algorithm will fail on the side of the sequence. So also you can actually rectify tap for OCR, right? So anything, just initialize, you get the, get the estimate curve. And also you can actually do the, from a single image, there's just tons of low rank textures everywhere. You can actually get the, the structure from, from a single image very reliably. And you can do matching now. You don't have to do match corners. You just do matching patches to patch. Region, in, entire facade to entire facade. Right? You don't have to engineer corners, edges, shift, and so on. Right? You can get a very robust matching between different facades. You can rectify them before you do the matching. Right. This is a, just a 3D from a single image, very accurate. And this is a 3D from four images of the building. Right. You cannot do this with any other structure from motion algorithm, not automatically. Right. Especially for this kind of repeated pattern. The shift is just a disaster if you apply them to, 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 to matching. Right. And also this is an eight image of this eight-sided buildings at uh, Illinois. Right. So you actually can get from such a sparse number of views because there's a tremendous amount of geometric information in the image that allows you to know where the camera is, know the matching between them. 
Okay, recognition, right? Also, it suffer from object uh, from from pose, view changes, and so on. So this is also the result from license plate, faces, like this is barcode. This is the Chinese character. This is English, or probably French, or I don't know what it is. So. So this is actually a result. You have a cell phone, you're pointing at anything. It's very hard for you to point something pretty precisely up front, right? So you actually can rectify them and send to OCR. So as I said, it's a surprise to me, actually, as a Chinese. I didn't know that the most majority of Chinese characters, this 2,500 most commonly used Chinese factors, are robust low rank textures, period. Right? So they are not low rank matrix per se. But after you take out a little bit, then they become highly symmetric. The global, local symmetry and the regularity impose such matrix are highly symmetric, highly low rank. Right. So you can then use that. This is actually improved Microsoft OCR. This is the, you know, on the this is on rotation, this is on skew, this affine transformation. You can also apply it on uh, projective transformation on four different fonts. In terms of all the fonts you saw in China, well, not the not the handwritten ones, but the more the regular ones. Right? You actually can rectify them using this kind of techniques. And turns out, of course, you can also use position for image compression, because if you don't do a corrected geometry, like the building like this, if you use SVD, PCA, to approximate it, it looks very bad. But if you rectify it, see the first two or three leading principal components already give a very, very sharp recovery of, of the image. So this suggests many things you can do with it. Right. So, I mean, there's just a couple of tech home messages I want to just emphasize, right? So the really low rack process for spot structure are really concentric to, to, to visual data processing. Low rank, there's no question about it, PCA is useful, but you have really, the sparse part plays the role of robustness to handle the errors. Right. And also, because thanks for all those advances in convex optimization, we can actually compute those things at unprecedented speed and scales now. And really initial lots of information. Now you look at the picture, now once with this kind of tools, you look at the picture completely in different eyes now. So before we we're sort of suffering with the kind of information we can get, geometric information or structural information we can get, right? Once you start with corners, edges, you're trying to put them center back. But now you are, we are actually overwhelmed how much information there is. Geometric, every patch, every region is telling you what your relative relationship with it, right? What's the best way to represent them? And hopefully, they will have a lot of impact on you know, all kinds of image processing, 3D reconstruction, object recognition algorithms. So I guess, again, I just tried to emphasize, there's a little bit of taste of a holistic here. I mean, you don't really do uh, low-level processing. It just as long as you're clear about what you're trying to estimate, uh, you try to use a global geometry, global symmetries in the whole region or whole patch. Right? Also, you can do completion, apply. If you know where the hole is, or you can actually identify. Because I just tried to tell you, I mean, the, there's many ways of using this kind of tools. They're not necessarily obvious, but you know, once you convert it to, to the kind of setting, it actually works very, very well. Also, whenever you have a data that has a matrix, you can actually apply this kind of tools, right? So this is the lattice semantic indexing we did, actually. Instead of using the PCA, we used the low rank plus sparse model. And the sparse part actually here is no longer errors. They're actually inform information about every single document with the keywords, right? Chrysler split dividend optimism, right? So this algorithm does it automatically, right? It doesn't even know what the title is, but those po all words pop up among all the you know, financial news you know, in that big batch of articles. Or you can also try to analyze in the images versus words, you know, people also put all this kind of weird uh, labels on the data sets. It's very corrupted. Basically, internet data is very, very corrupted. So you can use this kind of tools to do collaborative filtering, to filter out the errors, and hopefully clean up the data better, right? So in fact, uh, with this, uh, nothing really is new here because, you know, this is kind of things that come from, you know, the long history of control, right? Whenever you have a, a dynamic system or sys a data generated from finite dimensional system, you expect to see the observations to be very, very low rank. Right? People have been using that fact for many, many years. This is why we have common filters and so on. Um, for people who are interested in machine learning, well, the hard part problems are always hard in the same way, more, more or less. Right? So if you try to even learn a graphical model from the observables like this, turns out, guess what? You actually 
core of the problem is still a robust PCA problem, right? The observed covariance inverse, inverse of the covariance matrix function matrix is exactly sparse one plus low rank matrix. The rank of the matrix is exactly how many hidden variables, the dependency of your observations. The sparse part is exactly the conditional independence of your observations, giving all those hidden variables to you, right? If you have such a simple graphic model, you're actually solving an NP-hard problem if you try to learn it correctly from the data. So this is the kind of thing is not isolated. It's almost everywhere. So I just wanted to send some final you know, messages that, you know, it's really kind of interesting that uh, this kind of explosive studies in this high dimensional geometry statistics recently gets a lot of attention. It's really driven by you know, very good mathematics, very good powerful computational tools, and a lot, lot, lots of applications, right? So it's nothing's really new. I mean, that uh, we have been trying to do robust estimation from probably day one. Only what is new is that we have much urgent needs now, and also there's some much better algorithm and theory allows us, also people have leading the way and help us to, to understand those phenomena better. So what differentiates, this is just a show, shows a big picture in sort of if people are interested in more, more interesting theory. So we have done for sparse vectors, right? So this is in the literature comparisons and it has been done very, very well. And also, what, what people are doing now is trying to develop the parallel theory or algorithms for matrix, right? But for, as engineers like me, this kind of models are not necessarily useful yet, right? We have to handle errors because our measurements can be corrupted. We also have to handle domain transformations, especially particularly important for computer vision, right? We have to handle it in a principled way. So some of the tools, so as you can see, in mathematics, we always say that if you see a idea works once, it's a trick. If it works twice, it becomes a method, right? So now we have seen two ideas, worked very well. Are there any other much richer family of observations, phenomena? We have the same kind of property. Larger class of combinatorial problems can be solved in a similar way. Many, many smart people are working on this kind of directions now, are inspired by, by the work on sparse compression sensing and also low rank matrix recovery. Right? If you're interested in my talk, there's some you know, references a recent references on, on this, on the theory and on some of the two applications on image alignment and uh, image rectification. Uh, so using this kind of new tools, right? Uh, I'm not saying we're trying to compete with the traditional algorithm, but really is that trying to probably shed a new light on what, how to, there are other class of tools can allow us to track this kind of structures in images and videos, probably in a different way, at least, at least complementary to a traditional way of doing everything from the local features and, uh, and build everything up on top of it, right? Thanks. <laughs>